is a lifestyle market. Yes. And it's all, I believe it's like the, sleep, the sleeping giant of the Sydney market because people are in that position where you've got this gentrification happening. Yes. And then they, they suddenly get out there and live in that community from outside of the area and think, wow, this place is, it, it's nothing like we thought it was going to be. It's, it's better than we thought it, it would be. And lots of people get into the horse wheel and they don't leave. Yeah. Well, that's right. And look, people decide in a lot of respects their dwelling choices are between economic factors and lifestyle factors. And sometimes there has to be a trade-off between the both because you can't have both. Now, well, perhaps you can't have both. But what happens in the sense of the economic factors can drive a market to become more of a lifestyle market. Now, we've seen in the West uh, one of the reasons that gentrification, whether it's a chicken and an egg thing, is that uh, a more uh, we're starting to see a more mixed political environment in the western suburbs of Sydney, which were traditionally a Labor heartland. Mm. Now, we've seen that change. Now, whether that is a reflection of gentrification, but what it does mean is that these areas can no longer be taken for granted by politicians. Mm -hmm. They can't think, well, they're OK, they'll always vote for us, so we can just look somewhere else where we need to carry some voter activity towards our side. Now, that means that government spending will have to increase in these areas, mm -hmm. both at the state level and at the national level. And I think this is another positive for this area which will keep momentum building towards people looking for the uh, price advantages of these areas, of the West and the Northwest, um, and also the developing lifestyle nature of these markets as infrastructure, as amenities and facilities start to improve, as well as not you know, having a typically lower density type of environment, um, you know, more of a uh, I guess not so much a green change type of environment, but certainly a, um, uh, a less constrained type of rural or a less constrained type of residential environment, more of a rural aspect to, to these areas, which um, ap ap appeal to a demographic, you know, perhaps that's not as attached to the magnetism of the, of the harbour, but looking more to the beauty of, of the mountains and the rural aspect of, yeah, uh, of outer Sydney. Because one of the things you were saying earlier was about you know how they've got the auction in the inner city and they're going for a one bedroom shack and yeah. they're disappointed they missed out. Yes. You know, and then all of a sudden you know, they come out and see what they can actually buy for well, the same right. sort of money in around the Hawkesbury. It's just chalk and cheese. Well, that's right. And, and look, there are trade-offs because you know obviously inner suburban. Uh, markets offer higher levels of infrastructure, are closer to the CBD, closer to the central hub of Sydney, closer perhaps to work opportunities. But, you know, sometimes it is a trade-off mm. between those that want the lifestyle and will trade off an economic cost for that lifestyle, which may mean a longer commute to work, less job opportunities. But at the end of the day, is it not the lifestyle, is it the lifestyle that drives the economics or the economics that drives the lifestyle mm -hmm. for owners of yeah. property, you know, and I think that's and, and with a with a city such as Sydney, which is really busting at the seams in so many ways, and prices are always uh, more likely to rise than fall because of that underlying demand. These are important uh, factors for people who are looking to improve their lifestyle in a lifestyle uh, developing market, which I think these areas certainly are. Plus you're also talking about how people can now work remotely, you know, this whole online space and how it's just changed everything. Um, that's obviously going to have a factor in where people can actually afford to live. Well look, so much more of the workforce is now focused on information exchange mm. rather than the old type of economy that we had manufacturing um, particularly. So information exchange of course means IT uh, and so many people commute to the CBD or to work areas to sit in front of a screen for 10 hours or 8 hours and then back again. Mm -hmm. And really there's no reason why, particularly given if we, we get a, if we get infrastructure such as the NBN, which will make uh, internet access faster and cheaper, hopefully, then that facilitates that you know stay at home. And maybe it's not the stay at home telecommuter, it's the the development of hubs, of information mm. hubs within a region 
um, where people can go to and access, you know, in large numbers and can access IT facilities to do their particular work. Uh, and I, I personally think that is the future. Cut, it's not just build more houses or build more railways or bigger railways. I think we have to change our mindset about where we work yeah. and work where our lifestyle markets are. So get closer to our lifestyle markets. So lifestyle becomes the important issue or becomes the centre of our, of our choices. And I think that's what it should be. Mm. And some people's lifestyle might be a cosmopolitan inner city type of a vibe. That's fine. But lifestyles are also outer suburban, more rural, and uh, you know, different type of neighbourhood characteristics. Uh, and that should be able to be facilitated, not just because they're cheaper, yeah. but because they're just a, a choice between what somebody wants on the one hand and what another pit buyer or, or dweller wants on the other hand. And I said, we need to be able to facilitate those economic issues to match the lifestyle choices that people make. And that is uh, a factor in telecommuting, a decentralisation, bringing the workplace closer to where you live in a lifestyle market and thinking a little outside the square maybe, um, you know, not just trying to get people into the city quicker or, you know, yeah, with a bigger no. road, yeah. or which is just massive investment. Mm. Um, I personally believe, as I said, that uh, things such, such as worker hubs, which are IT hubs where people can go to um, and with the NBN and, and, and cheaper and cheaper uh, actual IT in equipment that uh, you know that can become quite cost effective and even more cost effective if it's a short commute or even a communal commute to these hubs yeah. from from societies. But I, I think that's a lot yeah, of the, the solution. It's definitely the direction we you know we need to head. You, you just see in some of the some of the inner city areas, you know, they've got these uh, furnished offices that you can just go in and, and access. So, but but also just on <coughs> on this, I mean that's. That's the, it's it's just the way things are heading. Um, I suppose when we look at that, where do you see the market heading? Because I think it's really important that we look at like the growth. We've seen some really good percentage growth, um, and is this going to be a continual thing, or are we in a situation where there's going to be some changes? Over the longer term, uh, because of the underlying dynamics of Australian housing markets, and really we're talking capital city housing markets here. Um, you know, prices growth will always be there. Now, it ebbs and flows, there are peaks and troughs, but our troughs always, our previous trough is always lower than our next trough, which means that prices are always growing. Now, the disclaimer for all this is the performance of our economy, and that's what keeps house price growth going, is that we have, you know, a very resilient, world-leading economic performance over decades, and that's what we need to keep our housing markets robust, uh, but we also need more supply, uh, we need more thought given to planning, uh, the types of properties where people want to live, in the places where they want to live, um, these sort of issues to enhance the, uh, the access to the market and the resilience of the market going forward. But I do see prices moving forward. We are an economy that always suffers when we are growing at, at full capacity from lack of labour. Mm -hmm. So we are always going to be an immigration economy. We always will require labour from outside when our economy starts to grow. We're always shortage of labour and that will always mean demand for housing. Mm -hmm. And with communities such as particularly Sydney where there's really nowhere left to go because you know we really are hemmed in here, there is nowhere left to go. Camden is 70 kilometres from the CBD. Uh, people are living there and commuting but that's just, as we've said before, that's, that is really an unacceptable lifestyle to a large degree because of the time that is involved in that, um, that what that means obviously is that property will continue to be a valuable commodity, particularly in Sydney, and that's why we're seeing so much more interest from different buyer groups in Sydney's western suburbs mm -hmm. uh, because of that price pressure. Yeah, you were saying something like 53% of the sales are going to investors. Well, they are, and, uh, and, and, and Sydney's west is a very um, popular place for investors at the moment. Now, this is probably a flavour of the month thing, uh, which will, and it always has been popular because it has consistent prices growth, it has consistently high yields, um, and uh, it, you know, it will continue to be so. But we may start to see, because of this flood of investor activity into Western Sydney, some moderation in those yields. Uh, and the good news for renters is that we'll probably get some moderation 
in, in rental growth as we get more supply coming through. Mm. But these things do tend to balance out. Um, investors will, will tend to be not as active in the market as yields fall. They'll look for optional investments. And then we'll see a rebalancing back to those sort of underlying fundamentals of the market, uh, which keeps that balance between rental stock at, or renters and owner occupiers, which is around about 70 30 typically. So, um, uh, well, first home buyers and, and non first, and, and oh, sorry, from those that are, are not homeowners and those that, are, that uh, are waiting to become mainly homeowners at 70 30 balance. But yes, look, the long term uh, future for is, 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 I mean, the West has a very consistent house price cycle. It doesn't have the peaks and troughs of, of generally some of the higher priced uh, regions. So it, it is obviously a very interesting proposition for investors who have certainty in terms of prices growth and a consistent rental growth. But that growth in, in investor activity will moderate that and then it will rebalance and, and go back to its fundamentals. Because the affordability of the first home buyer trying to get in the market nowadays, um, you know, the new home price, yes. new homes are through the roof, they're paying so, <clears throat> so much money just for a block of land. Um, like it's a massive cost for a developer yeah. to develop a block of land. Um, so, where do you see that? Do, do you see that changing the affordability sort of coming in? Is it going to become more affordable for? for someone to get into the marketplace? Or? Well, well, no. Um, affordability is not just a factor of prices, it's also interest rates. Obviously, they're very low at the moment. That's part of what's driving the market. That's improved affordability with those 5% mortgage rates at the moment. Um, that's being offset by prices growth. And our wages growth is, is pretty subdued, really, uh, which reflects an economy that's you know really just so-so at the moment, generally. Um, but I think that what we'll see is, uh, I, I mean, I, I think that because of the costs of new housing, um, and, and Sydney has the highest entry level new home and packages of any of the capitals for various reasons, and that is a disincentive, particularly for first home buyers, who have to pay four fifty, five hundred thousand dollars for a new small home and land package on the fringe, and you know, is it a surprise that they think, no, look, I'd rather look for an established property? even though I don't get the grant, or look for a new apartment somewhere closer in, even though it'll take two years to actually uh, take possession of the property. And I think that's why we see first home buyers re-evaluating some of those Western Sydney suburbs that do have medians in their price ranges, and I think that will be part of the other equation where people start their journey on the property ladder uh, as owners in uh, some of those Western Sydney suburbs, outer Western Sydney suburbs, that have generally flown under the under the radar, mm -hmm. and which are now, however, starting to become a lot more attractive to different buyer types. And one of those is those first home buyers. I mean, Sydney has 120 suburbs with a median house price below $500,000, and 50 suburbs with a median house price below $400,000. So, yes, it's expensive, and they are all in the west and southwestern suburbs. But there is certainly uh, suburbs in Sydney which are affordable for first home buyers in the west and the southwest, which do offer uh, you know, uh, adequate and good levels of, of infrastructure, transport and local amenities and facilities. And I think that you know, over time, once the, you know, the difficulties of living closer into the city mean even more prices growth, I think new first home buyers will, will become more attracted to uh, established properties in mm -hmm. um, in the west, in the outer yeah. west, and it makes sense because when you look at you know areas like um, Rouse Hill, yes. and they're paying something like five hundred thousand dollars just for the block of land. Well, that's right, so and that's you, yeah. so your first home buyers. Yes, you know, well, that's right, and and that's that's the point. There's a lot of re land released in the ponds and Rouse Hill, and, and good, uh, and and that's good policy by the government. They are doing all that they can. Uh, they have the first home buyer incentives now for new property. Um, they've released a lot of land, expedited that process, which is good. <coughs> Excuse me, and um, but what they're doing is attracting, particularly to the northwestern areas, a changeover buyer rather than a first home buyer, because the changeover buyer who's looking for, and there is a significant part of the market who is looking for a new larger home in the northwest, the hills districts, um, because that's again a lifestyle market. But their changeover buyers that are coming, maybe from Canterbury, Bankstown, um, but um, you know certainly from areas. Uh, and uh, change up buyers that are looking for new properties and of course mm -hmm. they're securing the land which 
probably was originally designed for first home buyers, yeah. but they're now building these very large McMansion style properties on them. And that's fine because that's just another, that, that is a lifestyle market mm. you're referring to, but it is those, um, that type of a, a, a um, you know, not a gated community, but a planned, a master planned community with larger new homes, but they are typically for a change up buyers that have moved up into their second or third home. Um, and you know have families and uh, and are looking. They don't care about the long commute. They probably work locally because uh, there's a lot of uh, established shopping areas in the hills for employment. A lot of tradesmen work out that way. Mm. Uh, and there's also a lot of uh, other industries that are active. So, but but that's not a solution to the cost of Sydney housing because it, it really only is another upper level on the rung of another upper rung on the ladder yeah, yeah. rather than being more property uh, for, for people who are renting to, to actually get into the market so yeah. and that's yeah, and as I said I think and that reflects again that land is land release is not really so much the issue because it's the, the cost of the new home and land package is very is very high and a first home buyer can look at areas like Macquarie Fields or St Mary's um, and purchase a home there in, in that sort of $400,000 range, uh, which is typical for the first home buyer at the moment. Um, and you, you know, get, uh, you know, sort of brick for brick the same sort of, and maybe even more than they would with a new property further out. Uh, yeah, and I think that's part of what, what's driving, you know, the gentrification of, of places like Macquarie Fields and St Mary's and Mount Druitt. Um, and I think that will increase. And it is, this is what happens. I mean, yeah. we've, we've seen inner, sub, inner suburbs are usually the first target for gentrification. We've seen Redfern in Sydney. These sort of areas are now very expensive and very popular through that gentrification process. Um, and, and suburbs where people would have, you know, which were uh, places of social dislocation. Mm. Um, uh, uh, and the inner city have now burgeoned into paper, gentrification and high price subjects. And the same thing will happen in those similar uh, 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 suburbs of, I guess, social dislocation yep. uh, in the outer west uh, and the southwest uh, for the same reasons, and over time they will become different communities. You know? So it does look good for Wall Street, you know, in, in that absolutely. sense. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Because it, it hasn't got that sort of, it hasn't got anywhere near that sort of stigma that some of those other Macquarie Well, that's right. Yeah, well, that's right. And, and it, but this is so. people are, it's like water finding its, its own yeah, level. It's a level. Yeah, 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 yeah and no, that's what happens. Yeah. And, it, and it work its way through those more affordable areas. The Central Coast, as we you sort of alluded to earlier, uh, that's that's a similar market in that sense. Um, that uh, you know, it's it's a much more stable market going forward. But there's a lot of retirees going to the Central Coast. Um, but there's still, it still is a Sydney suburban market per se because of the commute down there. And that is, once again, the choice between lifestyle and economics. Mm -hmm. You know, economics, we've got to live closer to the city. Lifestyle is, well, we like the lifestyle here. It's more affordable too, but it's more affordable basically because it's a lifestyle market rather than, or, or an entry, or not an entry, but a lifestyle market, a budget lifestyle market rather than uh, an economic market. Uh, which, which we've got to be closer to the city, the CBD, and, and sort of balance that out. Oh, oh, terrific. Just uh, in, in wrapping up, just a couple of quick things. Yep. The, um, you were saying something about the uh, March, uh, March 2014. Yep. There's a bit of a thought, you know, think will keep going up until then. Yeah. What's your thoughts around that? Well, I think that um, I think the Sydney market will grow overall in terms of its prices and growth by around about 7 to 10%. Uh, over the financial year. Sydney market's grown by about 3.5% uh, in the September quarter, probably another 3%, 3.5% um, over the uh, December quarter. That'll bring it up to 7% over the six months, a couple percent over the March quarter, uh, which will bring it up to 9 and then maybe a percent uh, over the June quarter. But um, it's probably a little under the mark. I was, you know, I've been leaning more towards a 10 to 12% growth over the financial year. But we do have the spectre of rising unemployment. Uh, these are predictions by the Treasury. Um, we can only really go on that sort of level of forecast over the medium term. And if unemployment does rise above 6%, and it is heading that way in Sydney at the moment, it will have a moderating effect on the market, but that's not unhealthy. Mm. That is a moderation. Um, we're certainly not... Uh, not, a, not a huge correction. Well, there won't be anything so. going over a cliff. Look, in the previous yeah. correction phase, the so, Sydney so market was down by 1.5%. <laughs> well, Gary yeah, is, but the, the, the thing with, this, with, the, with the doomsayer is, which is always very exciting and gathers attention, is 
that um, at the end of the day they say, well, okay, but wait till tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we know about tomorrow. Oh, yeah. It never comes. <laughs> That's so it. Uh, I think it's that way. But <laughs> Sydney's uh, 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 jumped every hurdle. It's passed every test. And uh, uh, incomes are still matching prices growth. So we're not really in a position where the market's getting ahead of itself. Bank, uh, the, 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 the bank lending policies are still very rigid. Uh, they're still very risk averse. Um, banks are, are, are very, very risk averse in terms of their lending policies, um, and that uh, acts to keep a, a um, uh, you know, a, a lid on on uh, any of the sort of extroverted lending practices that have impacted on markets, uh, particularly overseas. Uh, and, and going forward, what it basically means is that housing markets will move as the economy moves. If the economy grows, we will need more labour. They will come in. Demand for houses will rise, prices will rise as a consequence, and incomes will rise because the economy will be generating more work than workers, and that will put upward pressure on prices, and then we'll get upward pressure on interest rates, which will moderate the whole process. And that's the way it continues, and we are very fortunate to have such a robust, reliable, um, and conservative housing market that we do have in this country that has a number of layers, uh, but all those layers, sub-markets, regional markets, buyer types, over time they all really move in the same trend. And we, we should be very uh, pleased that we do have that. And I think that all the bits and pieces that go to make up the housing market, the taxation treatment for investors, for, for buyers, for first home buyers, uh, the incentives there, are all part of that finely tuned mechanism. And is it any wonder that foreign investors are climbing over themselves mm. oh. to get into the Australian well, think, housing market. I think they finally realised. <laughs> I think, you, you know, the 2000 Olympics was a showcase yes, for, I know. for Australia. And, that, and, that's and it, yep. everyone sort of went, wow, wow yeah. look at this place. Yeah. And that's why we should be, at, you know, good, good value. Well, we are good value and um, we're very fortunate that our economic outlook uh, is, is, is solid uh, over the medium and the longer term here. We are certainly a resource, uh, lucky to have a very strong resource uh, reserves in this country and that will continue to sustain us, but that doesn't mean that we, we have all our eggs in one basket. We also have massive tourist industries, we're, very, we're a bright nation um, and I think that that cleverness will, will uh, create other industries to complement the riches that we get from our, from our export and we will be tapping in to the uh, you know the evolution of the third world and second world countries as they become more wealthy and need the raw materials that we can supply uh, you know big economies like China and the US for uh, finished goods. So I'm very optimistic about the future. I think uh, there's always ebbs and flows. Oh. Uh, we're, we're we're at a big flow at the moment in Sydney, uh, not a record flow, um, but I think that we'll 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 ebb during the middle of the next year if we get um, a moderation in economic activity. So uh, that's the key. Oh, that's great. All right. All right. Uh, thank you very much for My coming pleasure. on the show. It was yes. great to catch up with you today. My pleasure. And um, yeah, thanks for joining us. And we'll look forward to catching you in the next episode. But uh, I just really do want to say it was just appreciate the time oh, that pleasure. we're able to uh, spend and just some of those insights about what's happening in the marketplace. And yeah, watch this space because uh, we're in a situation where we're going to share some real insights into what's happening out there in the Hawkesbury market and drilling down to the local economy and those local markets. So uh, we'll catch up with you on the show in the next episode. See you then. Bye.